Good morning. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Bernd Helmle. I'm working for a German company, Quellative, as a database consult, consult <coughs> primarily focused on PostgreSQL. And I'm talking today about writing a foreign data wrapper, basically introducing the API and um, the infrastructure around it, what you need to consider, what you need to do actually to get a foreign data wrapper for your purpose. Uh, what I'm not going to do is to uh, introduce uh, certain foreign data wrappers, show how they work. It's basically um, just about code, what code needs to be implemented to get a foreign data wrapper uh, working. So let's start. Um, why foreign data wrappers? Well, obvious thing, it's in the SQL standards. SQL MAD. Uh, MAD stands for Management of External Data, I believe. Um, and um, I have put a bunch of, of use cases where uh, FDWs might be interesting, or at least that are the use cases. I've used them in the past. It's migration proposals, heterogeneous infrastructure. For example, if you have many, many different or um, um, different databases or um, closed source databases in your infrastructure, you want to use PostgreSQL for reporting purposes or for ETL, for example, to integrate the data sources in a PostgreSQL database or to integrate non-relational data sources in a relational database. That's um, an interesting part too. For example, HTTP or web services, something like that. Um, or just for fun. <laughs> That's uh, at least the reason I've started with. Um, Basically, um, working with a foreign data wrapper is very easy, but um, I'm going to start from the top, from the bottom, uh, from the top to bottom. Um, what you've actually are uh, using, if you are going to use a foreign data wrapper, are these statements. So if you need to, no, doesn't work. No. Um, you need uh, a server definition, a create server using the foreign data wrapper you are actually want to use. This example is for Informix foreign data wrapper I'm actually working on. Um, the connection options, the user mapping um, to map the PostgreSQL user to the foreign data source user. It can be another uh, database user on the Informix side or just a login for the remote data source. Then the foreign table itself using the server definition. Um, the server definition actually is used to connect to, and the uh, foreign table options are pushed down to the foreign data wrapper and actually performing according to these parameters the remote query, for example, or the remote connection. Um, is actually someone using foreign data wrappers? I'm experimenting with them, and I'm using them on my own to Oh, which remote data source are your target? Um, part of what I want to do with it is. Okay. So I want to expand the CSV one to do other formats as well. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's an another use case. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have performed these steps, you actually can query the foreign data wrapper table. It's just uh, how to use it like normal PostgreSQL tables. You can create views on it. You can fill it out. You can join the, those tables. That's uh, no problem at all. You can't create indexes on them. You can't write on the tables. Uh, foreign data wrappers are read only. That's not possible, unfortunately. But there is something planned. But um, to get right of the foreign data wrappers is hard. It's a hard problem. So what we need to accomplish this, at least a C interface to the remote data source, of course. Uh, knowledge about the PostgreSQL FDW API, I hopefully bring to you uh, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, an idea how to deal with errors. It's basically about synchronizing remote data sources in error conditions. Um, if you have remote database uh, uh, services like Informix, you need to synchronize them because you can't just throw uh, the transaction away in PostgreSQL without deallocating memory structures in the Informix library, for example. So you need to, to synchronize the error handles. And uh, the mistake I have did in the past was not to think about the error conditions before. So that's like the most problem I have now, but uh, this can be solved if you think about it in, in beforehand. Um, then remote data mapping, how to map the remote data types to Postgres data types. That's an important step. And time and steadiness, because uh, you have to think about many, many parameters and problems 
or you might face with them. But mostly are just uh, regarding integration of remote libraries, for example, client libraries. There's also the Multicom project for Python virus. This might be of interest because uh, it's written in Python and you can then write your own foreign data wrapper in Python. It's um, easier than writing one in C, but uh, I had a short look at it. It's not uh, that powerful if you write your own C interface, for example, but uh, it might be an, an, an option. Also, there's a wiki page at wikipostcoscode.org uh, showing the current foreign data wrappers. I've originally planned to submit my Informix wrapper for the PG conference, but unfortunately I ran out of time for private reasons and didn't manage to make a release. But uh, keep an eye on it. I put it in when I think the code base is ready for release. OK, let's start. So the very first thing you need to implement are actually two functions. Um, a handler and a validator function. Here, are, uh, for example, the Informix foreign data wrapper handler and Informix foreign data wrapper validator. This one are defined uh, in the extension module. If you are going to write a foreign data wrapper, you need to write an extension. I'm not covering extension handling here, so I redirect you to the documentation about create extension, how to write one, but that's basically what you write in the SQL script for extension and the create foreign data wrapper at least, uh, defining the handler and the validator functions. The handler function is responsible to register the FDW API callbacks in the Postgres code backend. Um, that's basically enough what you need to do in the foreign data wrapper handler. Just uh, make an FDW routine structure with make node and assign the callback hooks to the structure and return. That's it. The validator callback is a little bit more complicated. Uh, complicated. It needs to have some intelligence. At least the purpose is to validate foreign data options uh, passed on via create foreign table and all the foreign table. If you go back in the slides, um, it, at, uh, where is it? Here. it at least validates those uh, options passed on here for well, if they're well formed, if they are known or ambiguous and such things. Um, to get them, there's a function untransform rel options to get an uh, foreign data wrapper option list. It's just a list of def elem structures. You can then loop through uh, the list and uh, just check the strings which are, are character strings push, pushed on. So you can simply do a string compare to check whether there's a known option or an ambiguous option and so on. The options which you want to support is up to you. You can pass down any options you would like, or reject options, for example. That's not a problem. But that's the main purpose of the validator callback. Um, I've seen, in, I think it's the Oracle foreign data wrapper, it also um, does a validation against uh, data type, Oracle data type and uh, PostgreSQL data type mapping. I'm doing that in the planning stage. I'm not here, but it might be an option too. Sanity check. It's a sanity check, yes. Because you then get the last one and override the first one, for example, it's, well, the principle of least surprise. But that, that, that's the main purpose of, of the validator callback. So, um, there's also a header file worth to read, the foreign foreign.h file in the PostgreSQL source tree. Um, I recommend to have a look at it because it defines some uh, helper functions. Those helper functions are now documented in the 9.2 documentation. They are missing in the 9.1 documentation. That's the reason I'm mentioning it here. Um, there are some helper functions to get, for example, uh, information about the foreign server you are currently using, uh, which returns a struct foreign server, or get user mapping returning a struct with information about the user mapping, actually retrieved with the user OID and server OID. The uh, foreign data wrapper by name function, got foreign table is the most interesting function here because you can get foreign table definitions with them. Not the columns of the foreign table. That's not containing in the foreign table structure, but information about the foreign table itself. For example, which server is it using, which user mapping, and so on. Which options are passed on. You can get them from them too.
the goods of a foreign data wrapper are basically implemented in the callback routines, in the five callback routines shown here, in the plan foreign scan, in the explain foreign scan, begin foreign scan, iterate foreign scan, and end foreign scan callbacks. Um, they are run on different uh, stages. For example, the plan foreign scan is run to uh, planning time. It, uh, its purpose is to retrieve the uh, foreign scan costs and row estimates uh, to initialize supporting structures for remote access. That's basically what I'm doing in the planning stage because if you have a remote database, it's well, obvious to use the remote database cost estimates. So you need to establish a database connection anyways to retrieve them. Um, so I'm basically establishing a database connection at the planning stage. Um, the planning info and uh, the cost estimates are basically contained in the planner info and rel op info parameters. Um, those structures have some important fields which are shown with the sample code here. The most important uh, values are in the plan node. So if you are entering a plan foreign scan callback, the first thing you do is allocating an FDW plan structure with make node. Then you're going to initialize the startup costs. Here, for example, I'm hiring a cache database connection. Uh, a new database connection is more expensive than a cache database connection, so I'm waiting a little bit higher. Then I'm getting the estimated rows from the Informix connection and initializing the base row, rows and width values with the average row size in bytes. And then calculating the total cost. This is a very crude formula. Uh, maybe you need some more sophisticated here, more fine grind, but um, that's actually what I, I've come up with at the moment. It just calculates the rows, um, uh, the, the row estimate costs based on the average width and uh, number of rows, and uh, it assumes it can, for example, write eight megabytes per second per remote connection. So it's up to you what you are actually calculating here. Um, the plan for and scan, I think it's gone in 9.2. It's uh, divided in three actually uh, callbacks now get uh, rel size, get, uh, get foreign rel size, get foreign path, and get foreign plan. Um, I'm not covering this here for 9.2 at the moment yet. But uh, that's what you need to do for 9.1. 9.2 has significantly changed here. That's just an example from me. It's just uh, to honoring a new connection or a cache connection. But I mean, what's the basis for the, for the cost? You know, that's what the default is for. Uh, it's just a default. The default. Yeah. It's just to think about that a new connection is more expensive than a cache connection, for example. But you can also honoring. Uh, yeah, how do you know what magnitude that should be relative to other things that you're Yeah, that would be more interesting to get a magnitude and then to push down, for example, with a foreign data wrapper option or something like that, yes. Yeah, I guess I would wonder why you're thinking about that at all, because the planner doesn't really have a choice as to whether to use this thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And just, uh, well, it's, it's basically only, I've, I thought a cache connection had, has basically um, already reused the table. So it's basically, for example, in the cache, for example, on the remote database side, such things, for example, that it's yeah, cheaper to, to retrieve the, the, the query data. Just, it was just a thought. It's not based on hard numbers. For example, I've seen the Oracle uh, foreign data wrapper uh, is uh, calculating it co costs uh, honoring the uh, network speaker. It assumes that it can um, write eight megabytes per second over a network connection and calculates the costs based on the row estimate uh, with honoring the network speed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's true. 
another proposal is that for I, when I implemented that, for example, in my in my proof of concept for informics, I just realized that it makes uh, because I I'm, have to retrieve the the rogue estimates from informics anyways, and I need a database connection anyway, so it's a little bit <laughs> nonsense because then the connection is already cached. <laughs> Because I reuse the database connection and begin foreign, uh, a foreign scan and end foreign, uh, uh, iterate foreign scan. That's ba may, may be a better option to cache database connection in the Postgres database itself, not to reestablish database connection over and over again. That's going to be very expensive, I think. Um, if you want to save, for example, like in this example, um, Plan data uh, in the plan for and scan state, you need to have to use the FDW private pointer. Um, this list must be copyable with copy object. Um, I haven't used it so far, but I know that the Oracle foreign data wrapper uses it heavily. It uh, pushes down the uh, cached plan data in the begin foreign scan state. And it uses along, you have experimented with that. It's basically the same that Oracle foreign data wrapper does at the moment. Uh, serialize the plan data as a byte A, uh, make a constant, append them to a plan values list, and attach that to the FDW private uh, structure field of the plan node. And use byte A to avoid uh, conversion issues among uh, different uh, encoders? No, it's, it's, it's a within the backend. It's, it's, just, it's just to to push it down easily in the executor state. Because I, Tom knows that certainly better. I think the planner is not pushing down the values, it's just copying the values. And that's the reason why it needs to be a, a list. Um, there are other interesting fields in the plan foreign scan state. Um, base rel, base restrict info, and base rel, rel target list. Um, the base restrict info is a list of predicates. It's actually that what was referenced, you're referencing your foreign table in a where condition. It's contained in that list, Logic, logically ended, so you don't need to care about or anything about that. Um, you can use that, for example, to transform that to a usable expression to push down them to the remote database server. For example, if you have where foreign table dot ID equals to one, you can filter, uh, push down that filter expression to the remote data source. Uh, it's up to you how you use it and what you need to make out of it. Um, the rel target list is the same basically for the uh, specified columns in a query. I haven't used that at the moment. Um, it's just to filter out unused columns of the query of the foreign data source. Um, the sample code here is just to show how to use it. I'm basically interested in operand, uh, operator expressions. Um, the base, base restrict info contains a list of restrict info structures. Those restrict info has a clause value. And if that expression equals to an op expression, then it might be of interest for me. And I'm examining it whether I can push it down or not. Actually, I think you can even push down function expressions of um, if you know that the remote data sources are supporting it. Substream, replace, substream. So. Maybe. But that would be uh, the target list then. So this one is just in this example, uh, in var expression, but of course, if you have something more complicated, you can examine that too. So begin foreign scan is the executor's callback startup, um, uh, startup callback. It has um, now a slightly different function signature foreign scan state. Um, the foreign scan state is, uh, says the function state values. Uh, it basically prepares the foreign data wrapper for scanning a remote data source. Um, The most interesting, interesting thing here is that uh, the startup parameters you are need for executing a remote query can be saved in an FDW state value. For example, if you uh, need to retrieve um, data conversion parameters and to save them when you are going to iterate through a result set from a remote database, you can assign that to, a, to 
to this white pointer. It's up to you how you say you can just attach your own structure information, cache uh, structure information there. It's up to you what you're using. The most important thing is that you have to distinguish, explain, and explain, analyze here. Um, just check um, with a bit and um, against exact flag explain only whether you are going to only explain or explain analyze the, the query because Postgres user are expecting and explain not to execute anything. So no user visible changes and just return the plan. Explain from scan uh, and once again, I oh know I've already told it, okay. Uh, explain foreign scan is random when explain is used. Um, it's there to inject information into um, the explain output. Um, well, if you don't have additional information, just return, or you can return actually, for example, the query, which is used against the remo data source, or uh, for example, the cost calculations you did, additional cost calculations you did, and timings, etc. Iterate foreign scan actually is executing the remote database or data source query or database query. It's up to you. Um, and fetches the data from the remote source. Um, what you need to do is obviously you need to do the data conversion here, fetch the data, uh, materialize a physical or virtual tuple. Virtual tuple is uh, considered to be faster. And when you are done, you just return an empty tuple and um, the executor is done at the, at, the, at the state iterating through through the result source. Um, this is just a sample code again. Um, what uh, you need to do to uh, return just a single number of uh, or single tuple, uh, or to initialize a tuple slot in a one iterate for and scan call. Um, the tuple slot can be retrieved again from the function state. Uh, foreign uh, scan state uh, node, um, initialize it according to the number of columns you are actually fetching. Uh, that's a mistake here, I see. Um, and iterate through the column list and assign the values. Every value in Postgres is actually when you are assigning them to a virtual tuple or when you handle them or returning is a datum. So you, you just, you, you can't pass, in, for example, integer just back. You need to get a datum from that. That's just value, for example, is a pointer to a certain data uh, value, and I'm just returning data from that uh, pointer. It could be a uh, text value or something like that. If you have an integer value, you can use macros like int32 uh, get data and something like that. So there are various uh, macros around that to convert um, a value into a data. But you can't just re you, you can't not simply return just a character string from from the backend. It's not possible. Um, if you are going to um, that, and that uh, that is a, a thing I'm not really sure about myself. It's the rescan foreign scan state. Actually, you are required to implement it. You, what the rescan foreign scan actually does is to prepare the foreign data wrapper to handle a rescan. So basically, if the iterate foreign scan starts from the beginning, I'm not sure where would have, that's really used. Recursive handling, recursive withhold, or? Oh, that's okay. So it should, it should yeah. Be okay. So, example, if you have a remote data source, you just. Uh, What's need because the documentation, for example, and the code says that you need to be prepared for changed parameters pushed on uh, to the plan node. Um, yeah, that would be where it was coming from. Ah, uh, okay. Mm, because you have a depending auto plan node. Ah, okay. So it's not really required to return the same tuples, I understand. Right. Yeah. Uh, say if you're doing it to one and then you're going to the other. Mm. The new outer values you're trying to match against the other. So. It might be then better to, to do the uh, filter condition push down to the remote data source in the iterate uh, foreign scan node and not before. Yeah, I think. Right now, that wouldn't actually happen unless you've implemented a new plan support for parameterized schema. Mm -hmm. So, probably right now, don't worry about it. Ah, uh, okay. But, 
but you need it. <laughs> you need to implement it. Yeah, that's it. I did it uh, uh, accidentally by just resetting the informix cursor, but that was, that's obviously wrong. So you need to re really to reopen the cursor again with the, so it can start for, uh, from the beginning on. Yeah, I don't think you have to push down the fault handling into the iterator. You, you just need to reset it in, in, the, in the read stream. Function. So you, you set it in, in begin or in the read stream, right? What I did was I, I set the, the filter conditions in the begin. Right. And I don't re evaluate them and, and when re scanning. Well, you probably need to reprocess them in this case. Yeah. To do it correctly. Yeah. Is that not right? Well, I think. That, that's a really complicated topic, I think. Um, I'm not sure about that, that either, how to do it really correct. So let me, let me give you an example. Think about an index scan on the inside of an S group. If the index, you know, the index has got a condition like index fault equals some expression mm -hmm. or other. You know, normally we'll evaluate that, that expression and we'll search the index for it. Well, on a rescan, it would have to be, you know, we'd have to know the I have to really think a little bit. Okay. So the end foreign scan is the uh, is the uh, callback when the executor actually ends a foreign scan. It finalizes everything. You need to close the resource set on the remote data source, clean up your resources, um, the connection, freeing memory, and so on. Everything you don't need anymore. Um, uh, the graphic is not really nice, I see. Sorry about that. Um, that's basically the flow around a uh, normal foreign scan with plan foreign scan, begin foreign scan, um, iterate, and now you have to push down metadata as well here, for example, for re evaluating the filter condition. And you have multiple steps the iterate foreign scan for each fetch, and basically the end foreign scan, um, at least. Um, if you are going to use an explain, you don't have the iterate foreign scan, but you have an explain foreign scan node here. And if you have an explain analyze, you have an additional explain again with the iterate foreign scan steps. That's the main difference. With 9.2, the blind foreign scan, as I have already said, is gone. Actually, three callback hooks now. Uh, what 9.2 has now uh, additionally is a callback routine for analyze. So you can implement your own analyze function to collect remote statistics there. I haven't looked at it uh, yet because I um, haven't had the time yet for experimenting with it. But the analyze uh, callback can be then used, for example, to retrieve the remote costs, store them uh, uh, in the system catalog, and um, let the planner do the right thing. <laughs> um, Andrew, I think the, the file FDW Point that is actually having an analyze function. Some basic calculation. But it might be an example yeah. how to use it. Yeah. So if you want to look at that, look at the file FDW driver. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, additional words about memory management for all those who didn't actually uh, did the backend hacking uh, in the past. Um, you have to take care for memory allocation. Postgres uses PALOC and allocates memory always in the current memory context. If you're using external libraries, you always tend to use their own to use their own malloc or memory allocation uh, functionality. So take care about that. You, you can't leave it up to Postgres to do the right thing on transaction of all. You need to clean up the external libraries yourself. Um, that's really important because you then you leak memory. Uh, Postgres backend is designed to stay longer, for example, if you have a pool or something like that. Um, and that's the next thing. I, next thing um, I'm coming to it. Uh, this is wrong. Uh, all in slides, sorry. That's error handling. Um, 
you really need to synchronize uh, data sources when you have uh, error conditions in the PostgreSQL backend or in the remote data source itself. It's all about cleanup. Um, you can't make sure that with e-log error everything is clean up because e-log error doesn't return. It just resets the transaction and uh, you don't have any possibility to reach again. For example, your function pointers you have allocated in a remote data source or something like that. You need to take care about that. Uh, another thing to consider is to mapping uh, remote error conditions to SQL states. There's an error codes appendix in the PostgreSQL documentation. I highly recommend to read over okay, instead. Um, or to just map them to error, uh, PostgreSQL error codes, like uh, a warning, for example. If you have an Informix error a connection warning, you can just map it to a PostgreSQL warning and give some detail about it, what it was. Um, one problem I had was, uh, I think it was during data uh, type conversion, that I need uh, to react on errors in the backend errors to give my remote data source the chance to clean up. Um, if you're using, uh, we're coming later to it, uh, for example, type input functions and you are uh, issuing uh, miss from data to a type input function, it's errors out and you have to take care and for example, that you track the memory allocations on the remote side. Then you might use uh, a pg-try, pg-catch block. That's a very interesting infrastructure in C or in the backend. I think that's an example how I'm going to use it. Um, I had a problem with informix because you can use, uh, has anybody used informix in the past? Yes. Um, for example, you have an SQL CA or a SQL DA structure and you need to deallocate that. And in this case, this is what basically the IFX free bank call stack uh, is doing, freeing the resources. Um, the type input function, I'm coming to it later again, is throwing an error in case you have misformed data here. And I need to react with that and rethrowing the connection. Don't suppress the error, rethrow it. That's an idea from Andres. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hana, whom are you? Data type conversion. If you have a remote data source, it's a good idea to think about how to use that data type well used in PostgreSQL. Um, if you have a well formatted strings, for example, a date value in this form, um, it's the easiest way because you just can call type input function, put them in a type input function, you get a PostgreSQL datum back um, with, the with the right uh, data type you are want to use. That's the easiest way. Um, binary compatible types, for example, an info byte integer can be used directly, for, of course. Um, binary data should always be byte A you know, because you can't be sure what's in there. Maybe it's a structured binary data, then you can map it to a certain data type, but that's up to you. You have to decide it. You have to think about it. Uh, string data must have wallet encoding. So make sure the coding from the remote cell side to the to PostgreSQL side is correct. Maybe you have to do your own encoding conversion, um, but uh, you have to take care for it. If you have a remote database source which already does not client encoding correctly, then you're out of uh, trouble. Um, but for there example, are, there are the yeah, that's the next slide. For example, it's just to give a hint, um, you can use, of course, the PostgreSQL infrastructure, get database encoding returns to actually the backend encoding. PG2 encoding conversion is another example to do encoding conversions in the backend. Um, the uh, header files in the MB directory might be of interest to you, uh, interesting if you want to deal with that. For example, you have mentioned you want to access uh, remote configuration files. If they're UTF-8 encoded and you have a Latin database, you have to make sure that probably they're encoded in the backend then. Um, wrong direction. Here's an example to get a uh, type input function. Um, if you have the target type OID um, of your foreign table, here called the input OID variable, um, 
it's easy just to uh, do a cache lookup, retrieve uh, the type tuple, and extract the type input OID from that function, and pass them over the code before it's included in that function, and pass them over into uh, OID function call, for it's OID function call two. There are various OID function call uh, functions available with one, two, three, four parameters. And uh, get a data, for example, for that C string here located in buff. And you get an actually uh, a well formatted PostgreSQL data type as a data back. That's basically everything you need to do. So I'm basically done. Um, do you have any question? Could you give some sort of uh, ideas about what uh, what the writing API would want to look like? The the write API what? The the the, 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 the API to do writes. Writes. Oh, I think writes is is hard. Well, <laughs> yes. That, 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 <laughs> yes, that's that's why it's not in the first iteration. Or the, uh, the first thing that will come to my mind is that uh, you need to to have to synchronize the transaction, of course, of the remote data sources. I think that's that's the most inter interesting part, because if you have a transaction on the remote side, a transaction on the PostgreSQL side, you must be able to to react, to roll back the transaction, to synchronize them. It's basically a two-phase commit. Don't know. Okay. I, I saw that discussion on the hackers mailing list as well. That's a recommendation I'm taking from the source comments where the virtual, uh, virtual tuple is going considerably faster. And the physical tuple is, uh, tup is much serious, I think. Virtual tuple isn't. It's just a tuple store, I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
First and foremost, it's much better. I believe an ASCII document would work really well, but it might be possible. I mean, the compression part isn't terribly difficult. I mean, I've already got help answers if you can take that, but the header of a document document is probably the most difficult thing to do. Yeah. 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 Yeah
for the various foreign tables. So what that we'll saves a, right. really a real amount of time. Right. So th this is something I, I put into BVI links way back when. Um, yeah. Is there, should there be more machinery for doing that? Yeah, right. I think so. But the problem is that each remote data source connection has different parameters. It's, it's, uh, it's different. For example, if you are using SQLC and Informix, you are going uh, to, it's embedded SQL, but what you are going to use, like ECPG, it's the fa favorite uh, interface to Informix. You can SQL CI, but that's really complicated and I don't want to use it. Um, it's just an identifier if you want to reuse the connection, set connection identifier. That's a, you just need to maintain the, the, the character strings with the identifier. Um, but I know that, for example, OCI <coughs> connection handlers need more information. So at least the infrastructure should handle that you might attach uh, uh, your own structure to it, to the cache. But with a hash table, it's not that complicated. So, in, so you kind of want something that was like a pointer to a struct, isn't that? Yeah, for example, that's what I do with, with an HTAP at the moment. It's just a connection identifier with an uh, structure attached to it containing all necessary information. Would, do you think that's generic enough for uh, practical purposes? Setting up on a, a hash table is not that complicated. Yeah. At, at least for me. So I, I can't only speak for me, you know, but. What I've also tried is to, um, to cache uh, remote information from the Informix server for the various tables. But I abandoned that approach because um, it was not really required, like a foreign uh, metadata cache. But uh, I didn't use it anymore. Yeah. But you have to create your own debugging uh, yeah, too. Yeah. So you now create it. You create it. So something I establish for a remote connection or something like that. Sure about that, no. Is it really treated as a sequential scan? We need to ask the optimizer. There a discussion about uh, indexes on phone tables? Thank you. 
you generate the correct path and you get foreign paths, a bunch of callbacks. Yeah. Um, the, the way this works at the Oracle table is you look at all the indexes and mm. you generate chaos for each index. And then, then you know, further up, you decide whether or not you have the space for anything. Mm. Wasn't there a discussion about indexes on foreign tables recently? I recall uh, s I something. Was it last week? Uh, somebody, somebody talked about like, how yeah. they stuff. Uh, I haven't followed it closely, but just remember that. Yeah, I can't see how you possibly think about it. Yeah, that's. But what I'm thinking about is just an information, there is an index just a virtual foreign index or something like that, but I'm not sure about that. Well, I, I can see one case where that could be used. If you, if you had a foreign data router <coughs> and you said, I want to take a snapshot of this remote database and then build a new index on it, and I'm going to do my filtering. Mm. And then Google Apps and then Star for all my users. Yeah. yeah. Further questions? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to be writing for PWA. Uh, is it uh, the equivalent of uh, reports here on the table writing for PWA to take uh, Where well, I get the resource for, well, I haven't understood. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting uh, question. So do you want to do you want to start looking at the source code or some documents? Ah, okay. Um, did correct the uh, Well, I started with just trying, <laughs> and th this this leads ultimately to studying the source code or looking at it. That's uh, the documentation is basic. There is uh, nine two has um, some improved documentation. I think the helper function are actually in the documentation now, but. Um, um, I think you, you have to study or to, to look at the code. And um, I pretty much recommend, for example, Aldo Lawrence has uh, written the Oracle FDW uh, foreign data wrapper. He's, um, the, this foreign data wrapper is really complete. It, it has a uh, query predicate pushed down. It uh, evaluates the real target list and can, uh, it had rather various um, approaches to push down function calls to an Oracle database. It, it has, uh, it has no connection cache, I think. Um, um, it's pretty much complete. It's, it's a good starting point, I think. Um, I'm going to release the foreign data wrapper for Informix as well, but I haven't got a really stable code release at the moment. I originally planned that for PGCon, but I ran out of time, unfortunately. So keep an eye on the wiki page. <coughs> keep an eye on the wiki page. I'm going to push it there. Uh, on, on the hackers list, yeah. You mean if you have questions about FDW problems, yeah, hackers list. That's that's the best point I think. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much in time. Thanks.